taking the Florida, Florida, Florida nature tour of Arcadia Mill. And the reason I started this Florida Florida tour is because this site is, has really unique ecology here. Um, mostly because this site has been natively, you know, populating its forests ever since about the 1860s when the mill site was abandoned. And so everything you'll be seeing here for the most part is all native species. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Because for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years, humans have been collecting knowledge of plants how to use them and using them in their daily lives. And today, you know, we take advantage of the fact that we have Walmart and Home Depot and pharmacies to go get the things we need. But people didn't always have that. In fact, for the majority of human history, they did not have that. They've been using the land. They've been using the forests, the fields, the, the streams, the rivers, the oceans to survive. And so as we walk around today, I'm going to be picking just a few of the native species we have here and talking about how people have used them, not only Native Americans, but into the early colonists and even into today, how we use some of these plants. Um, and I do want to give a disclaimer that uh, any of the plants I'm talking about, if I talk about people ingesting them or using them as medications, don't go home and try that um, without seriously doing your research learning the true methods. Many of the methods, in fact, have probably been lost to history, especially in regards to Native American traditions, considering that many of the Native American of tribes that lived in this area and used these te techniques, they died out, in, in, to be honest with you. Most of these tribes that were here before European contact, they've disappeared completely. Um, so we don't know exactly how they used different things, but as archaeologists like this site uh, is used for, as archaeologists you can actually find evidence of how people used plants in the archaeological record. You can find a fire with pits of, of different fruits and you can find a pit uh, or a trash heap that has seeds and, and burned pieces of wood and all of this can you know help us piece together how people have culturally used the land to survive. So, without further ado, we're going to get going. If anyone has any questions at any time, let me know. I will be passing around products that I have here in my little bag of wonders to kind of give you examples of what uh, people use and what they would have looked like, and you can actually touch them and, and whatnot. So, all right, y'all can follow me. One of our first stops here, we've got some muscadine vines starting to grow back. This one reaching out here, it's going to try to reach all the way across, actually, it looks like. Uh, that is a type of muscadine, wild grape, scubbernog, goes by many, many names. And there's many different varieties in this area of Florida. Most of the varieties are, have edible fruits, not all of them taste great. But when you make jams or jellies or juices or wines, you can hide some of the more unpleasant bitterness or sourness. And people have been using muscadine grapes or scuppernogs for food and drinks for a very, very long time. Um, one of the most unique ways of using this plant that I came across in my research is actually as a snare. So back during Native American periods in this area, much of the hunting that was done here was actually done with snares. Most people think of a Native American hunting using a bow and arrow in their minds. But the quickest, easiest way of hunting and the most, you know, energy efficient is by setting a snare actually to catch your prey. And these could be used as deer snares, especially ones that had berries on them to attract the deer. And so they would tie them up, arrange them, and were able to snare their prey in a very efficient way. Especially when you consider that hunting in like this kind of a forest environment might have been very tricky back then, navigating your way through. So. Yeah, I've got muscadine wine on my, I mean, uh, berries on my property and I do make wine from it. Yeah, and what color are your berries? The colors are black Okay. they're ripe. Yeah, some are actually gold. I've seen gold ones. I've seen ripe green ones. So they come in a vari multiple varieties with the black ones. I mean, those beautiful big black oh, berries are very Excuse gorgeous. Us. Excuse us. Excuse us. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. They don't get very big, the ones by my home. They get yeah. about maybe the size of my little fingernail. So well, I great. have to pick a, pick a lot of them. Pick a, that takes yeah. a lot of work, so huh? this year I only got about six quarts of wine, but it's worth it. 
Yes, oh, it is wonderful. My great aunt used to make it too, and I, we used to joke that it would, it would make your hair fall out. It was so strong. She, I don't know what she did, but it was very potent wine. <laughs> but people have been doing that for thousands of years. Those berries were were very important to people surviving here. And we'll actually be seeing a few other varieties of burying plants as we walk during this first part of the tour. So, follow me. muscadine. You can see it from above rather than from below the leaves. When people think about holly, they often think about Christmas time and the spiky American holly like what you see here on this tree. But here in the southeast, we've got multiple uh, types of holly that grow here natively. American holly is one of them, um, but we will be seeing a few other types of holly. Not all of them have the super spiky leaves like you see, but if you look real close, you'll see little, little spines all along the edge of the leaf. Um, this type is just the, the first one will pass. We'll also pass uh, inkberry or gallberry, which not a lot of people know. It is a type of holly, that Latin name before it, ilex or ilex. It is what designates it as a holly. So we'll see uh, inkberry up here in just a moment. We've also got sparkleberry out here. Is that a type of holly then, the sparkleberry? It is. Okay. Yeah. So here we've got some gallberry. Nope, this is the gallberry. Like, wait a minute. Yeah, you can see tiny little ridges along the edge of the leaf. It's almost hard to see them, and they usually only start about halfway up the leaf. And which variety is this? This is gallberry. Oh, okay. And these leaves could be used for teas. And gallberry um, honey is extremely highly prized. Many beekeepers love to have gallberry around their hives because gallberry um, honey is, is delicious. Um, but these types of hollies were very important in the longleaf pine ecosystem that was here long before Europeans arrived and cut all of it down for the lumber industry. But these would have actually gone through a cycle of forest fires every six, 10 years or so and it would have kept these to about a shrub level and then it would have burned it and they'd have grown back rather quickly. So the fact that these are so tall is only because the fact that we don't have controlled burns here. We cannot burn these the way they natively would have been burned um, to grow back in small shrubs and be nutrients for low ground animals. So um, this is a little bit different from how you would see it in a native original environment. of blueberry bushes over here. These are uh, a type of blueberries that do well here in the wet area along our boardwalk. On our nature trails where it gets drier, you see a different type of blueberry. Um, blueberries do very well in the sandy soils of Northwest Florida, and they've been nutritious at, for thousands and thousands of years. You know, people would gather blueberries for food and they help the uh, animals as well. Many animals love blueberries. So the last type of holly we'll talk about here is the yopon holly. 
many uh, homeowners know this is kind of a an annoying plant to deal with because you can cut it all the way to the ground and it just keeps coming back over and over again. And you can see much better on this one than the gallberry. The, oh, that's a spider on my hand. <laughs> Get off of there. All right. Oh, I, I, I have the leaf. Okay. But you can see the little spines along the edge of the leaf a little bit more clearly on the yopon. And that gets real red berries, right? It does. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, bright red berries. The berries oh, yeah. are not edible. But the leaves are used for a traditional beverage called black drink or cassin, cassina, asi, depends on which culture you've studied. But black drink has been used for uh, by Native Americans long before the Europeans ever arrived as a ceremonial beverage. They would brew it in huge pots of, of uh, boiling water and um, they would drink it for celebrations, for rituals. And you can see here in a picture it being prepared by women. And then the men are all sitting around drinking it. Now you might also notice too in this picture, some of the men have an interesting uh, uh, side effect happening there. <laughs> can you tell what they're doing? <laughs> they're, uh, they're getting ill from, the, from drinking all of the black drink. And they would do this specifically because they believed that by getting rid of all of this from their body, it was purification, that they were getting rid of the bad things in their, in their systems. But that also led to this getting a very interesting Latin name by the early scientists who, who kind of started to study Yopon. They took on the, uh, the story of them getting sick and called it Ilix Vomitoria. So, and it sticks to this day, but... Um, you, the way you do this is you take the leaves and you roast them to a dark brown color and then you boil them in water until you get a brownish type of tea. Now it's called black drink because when you put it in these big pots like what you see here, it would have been pitch black, but it's actually a just normal brown tea color. And this is black drink. I made it last weekend for the tour. Um, it hasn't gotten cloudy yet, so I'll keep using it until it does. Um, but if you'd like to smell it, it should still smell. Can you drink it? You can, you can, uh, not this one. I mean, uh, it's uh, been a while. <laughs> but if you'd like to smell it, it just yeah, smells generally right. like a normal okay. tea. Some say it also has kind of a cigarette smell. Yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's not horribly unpleasant, but it's also yeah. not yeah. super pleasant. But I tell you what, when you're boiling this and it's hot, I mean, your whole house smells like this. Oh, so, you but. didn't get. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> The reason they would use this primarily is because not only would they use it for purifications, but this is the only naturally occurring source of caffeine in North America. So um, when you make this tea and you drink it, you were all hopped up. You were, you were feeling the caffeine because per cup, I mean, it's got more caffeine than coffee. And so they would drink it both for the stimulating effect and for the purification concept. And if anyone's interested, at the end of this tour, I have some takeaway items. These are um, printed cards that have the recipe for making your own black drink. And it's printed on a historic printing press downtown in our uh, museums down there. And it's got an image of the preparation of black drink, the etching. So feel free to take one. If you're not gung-ho for, for uh, trying it, it's, all, it's kind of a fun conversation piece to hang on your fridge too, so. But um, one of the favorite stories with this is that, um, you know, the, the Creek name for this is Aussie, A-S-I. Um, and it actually is part of the name of one of the most prominent Seminole leaders known today, Chief Osceola. His name actually translates to Black Drink Singer or Black Drink Cry. And so he most likely would, you know, drink this and get really, really excited. So. Um, that's probably the source of this name, but it's it, it was a name given to him. So as chief of the, um, as one of the recognized chiefs of the Seminoles. So does anybody have any questions about this before we move on? So Native Americans use this, but also after the settlers realized the benefits of having a substitute for um, coffees and teas in times of war or shortage or blockade, they realized, hey, we've got this in our backyard, we can make a good alternative to, to teas and coffees. Because in times like the Civil War, they came up with every way of replacing coffee they could. They would um, use dandelion roots and okra seeds and chicory and, I mean, there's some really interesting ways they tried to substitute coffee.
All right. So we're standing over one of the um, archaeological remains of the mills that were here. This is uh, the ironstone wall around here formed the plunge pool. Um, and it was a very, very wet area here. Um, however, this environment here was altered slightly by the people who built the mills here because they were water powered mills so they built all kinds of ditches and dams to control the flow of water so the way the water moves through the landscape here is altered from its natural course but it would have been a wetlands area it's very low so it would have been quite wet just as it is today maybe not in certain areas but it would have been very wet and one of the tree species you typically see growing in very very wet areas is cypress and here we've got a large, very old cypress tree growing up out of the plunge pool. Probably started growing here as soon as milling ended, honestly, in the 1860s. Um, but this cypress tree is a, a great example of the adaptation cypress trees have to growing in wet environments. If you look around the ground down here, you'll see tons of uh, stumpy looking things sticking out of the water and sticking out of the mud and it these are adaptations to um for the roots to actually get enough oxygen for the tree to survive in the really wet areas that it grows in so think about it you know underwater there's less oxygen it the the way i usually explain this to, to children especially but to most people i say think of it like a snorkel you know you need your oxygen you stick it stick a snorkel out into the air so you can get enough so this is exactly what these root adaptations are doing, is getting oxygen from the air that it can't get underneath the really wet ground here. Was cypress used at all for any of the mill work? Or? Yes, cypress was used for um, making shingles and buckets because of its rot resistance. And also cypress was used for making wooden pipes. So being this area not having any like ores or minerals in large quantities, they didn't have metals uh, produced what kind of here. Pipe are you talking about? They used it for transporting water. So okay. they would have pipelines to certain parts of mills, especially steam powered mills. Um, they would have wooden pipelines for uh, putting out fires and for getting fresh water to certain parts. So you can actually see an example of this in our boardwalk and or in our pavilion. We have a cypress pipe. Um, and it's straight and it rots from the inside out naturally, so it would have made it easy to bore a hole through the middle of it. So. But one of the most common uses of it by Native Americans was actually for canoes. Its uh, width and straightness made it perfect for making dugout canoes. Um, and back before Europeans arrived and, you know, people imagine old Western movies and thought all Native Americans got around on horseback, but that's not true. Prior to European contact, the main mode of transportation in this area was canoes, waterways, because this is Florida. We got plenty of water. Bless you. And um, so they would actually have canoes in strategic locations throughout their migratory, you know, paths. So Native Americans would spend this season here, spend this season here, spend this season here, based on what's there, what they need. And um, when they would go to certain areas, they'd uh, have their canoes there. And when they'd go to leave, a lot of people don't know this, but they'd actually sink the canoes underwater to preserve them and to keep them secret. So they would create caches of canoes all over the place to save them for the next time, next year when they get back to that area. Because underwater, being that there's less oxygen, organic material doesn't deteriorate as quickly, it doesn't rot. So they would sink their canoes, come back, pull them on up. This is also the reason why after a big hurricane, you often see in news articles, six prehistoric canoes found in blah, 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 washed up by hurricane blah, blah, blah. That's because they would have all been there together, left behind on purpose. It's not just some anomaly. That's because that was where they would store them and save them and sometimes forget about them or maybe something would happen to that tribe or they decide to move elsewhere and they just leave them behind. So. Also in this spot, we have one of the uh, famous named plants from the Spanish period here. We've got Spanish moss on a couple of trees. We've got one hanging, some Spanish moss hanging there. We've got some on the side of this tree over here, the cypress tree. And Spanish moss is a type of air plant, a lichen that grows very well here in the southeast. You see it on, in, on, in all these big old plantation pictures and stuff. Um, but it's, it was extremely useful to early people in this area. Spanish moss was used as a stuffing material for mattresses, pillows. Um, even the early automotive industry used uh, Spanish moss to stuff car seats. 
and they wouldn't just take it from the tree and shove it in there. There's lots of yucky things that like to crawl around in Spanish moss. People often think of red bugs. And that leads me to one of my favorite anecdotes from early settlers here. They thought, oh, look at this beautiful Spanish moss. If we rub it on our babies' heads, they will grow curly hair. No, no, you just, you just gave your, your children bugs, but congratulations. <laughs> they, they, that is something I came across, and I'm like, you're kidding me. Okay, whatever. But Spanish moss, if you remove the gray outer um, bark, as it's called, from the Spanish moss, uh, it, you are left with a black kind of like hair-like filament underneath. And you get this through a process called curing. So you can cure Spanish moss and you get this black hair that's very coarse, very, very durable, and pretty much lasts forever. There's no red bugs in there. No. <laughs> the curing process kills the red bugs and um, removes that gray, flaky outer bark. Does of that the uh, moss. withstand? Uh, um, if, if, if it had been moved, removed, and it was left laying in a sand heap, would that maintain its structure? Um, you're talking about the filaments, just this? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I know that the curing process, it really had to be held, it had to be hung, it had to be not in contact with the ground, right. and um, so I'm not sure what resting on the ground. You're, reply, you're implying that, you know, sometimes Spanish moss falls out of the trees and... Well, you know. yes, and if they used it for stuffing, is it possible that um, many, many, many years ago... The uh, reason I'm asking is, when I built my home, some of the Mexicans that were working on my property were picking stuff that looked like that from the ground. From It was, you know, if you took a shovel full off, mm -hmm. there would be this black stuff that looked like that. Yes. And I, yeah, I, I, they didn't. When I asked, what what are you doing? Uh, this is what's left behind when Spanish moss dies. That's why I'm so Spanish moss, it when right? it does die, this is left behind. Okay. But um, I know that they did. You probably could collect it from the ground as after it would accumulate. But the most controlled way of making it and selling it, and the way most southern families did it, was curing it okay. because you were able to, you know, know you had this much. You picked this much, and all of it could be processed. Okay. So yeah, you're probably. You're probably correct. I have seen this hanging from trees where it has died before. So, um, but often like this is also the stuffing in chairs. People will mistake it for horse yeah. hair. A lot of people think this is horse hair. And um, if you take a chair to an upholsterer and it has this in it, they'll often recommend, I'll just cover it back up because it's the last. Like it doesn't, it doesn't break down very, very quickly. And it's very, very coarse and bouncy even well into its use, so. Very interesting stuff. And like I said, early automotive, they stuffed your seats with it. That's what was inside, you know, early Model T Fords in the seats, make them soft, so. But yeah, any other questions? Well, before we go on, I'm going to tell you why it's called Spanish moss. Now this is all just folklore and hearsay, but there's an old legend that has been passed down through the ages. That Spanish moss, also called old man's gray beard in some places, it's called that because Spanish moss was created when a old Spanish conquistador named Gores Gores came exploring, fell in love with an Indian maiden, and she wanted nothing to do with him. So she tried to run away from him, and she ran up a tree and thought, ha ha, old man can't follow me up here. Well, he tried to follow her up the tree, but his big bushy gray beard got stuck in the branches and he died in the tree, and his beard became <laughs> Spanish moss. So there you go. It's a fun tale to, to, to tell at, at gatherings. If you're, if you're under a big, beautiful old oak tree, I'm sure that's how that story got spread. So, <laughs> Gorez Gorez, dirty old man. The OG dirty old man. magnolia identified on the site. We have your traditional southern magnolia, which has those big glossy leaves that grow the pretty white blossoms. Um, we've also got southern bay or sweet bay magnolia, um, also called swamp bay. 
and we'll see some of that as we move further along. boardwalk that we lovingly call the swamp walk um, because of all the water you know control methods they took here this area has standing water all the time and um, it's a great spot for for finding snakes so we might come across a snake or two as we walk last time we did this tour we came across two snakes contributing to the future snake population <laughs> as we were walking Pythons, were they? No, they were uh, banded water snakes. So here we've got a variety of willow. Um, this willow is not like your weeping willow you often think about with the branches drooping down. Uh, the leaves are the same shape as that uh, as a weeping willow, um, but a unique property of willow trees. Um, the willow species, is that the inner bark of the tree, which is kind of a light pink color, uh, you can see a little bit here where some has been peeled away, um, the, the bark actually contains salicin. And when you boil it, um, it creates a reddish tea. And when drunk, it actually has the same properties as something else that has salicin or salic acid in it today. Anybody? Aspirin, Aspirin you're right. So this was used um, for as long as time as a way of treating, you know, joint pains, aches and pains. Um, and it's a very easy thing to produce and it was widely used all across the world, in fact, where willow grows. Um, and it was one of the first modern medicines really marketed. They were able to realize what was in this willow bark that gave it this property and they reproduced it into aspirin. So. Many people actually still use this as a remedy. They will go out and get their own uh, willow bark. Leah is the snake spotter. She's very good at finding them. So here we've got an example of the uh, Swamp Bay or Silver Bay Magnolia. Um, and the leaves actually, um, if you look at them green on the tree, they do have a similar shape to culinary bay leaves, like what we you know, use for cooking, especially Mediterranean food. Um, but the bay leaves we buy in the stores are from the Mediterranean. But these were used traditionally by Native Americans um, in the same way that they use bay leaves there. It doesn't have quite the same taste. It won't give you the same effect as what we use today. Um, but the reason it's called also silver bay is because the backs of the leaves have kind of a dull silvery shine to them. And uh, when they're healthy and they're not spotted like this one, this has some sort of sickness that is common in, in uh, swamp bay in this area at this time. Um, the, the leaves will, will shimmer almost in the moonlight uh, from what we've heard. Pollution? Huh? Is it called pollution? I don't think so. Um, they were saying it's some sort of uh, fungus or disease like that. But it could be uh, that it is the root causes pollution, but the ecologist who came out said they haven't really figured it out. It's just they've seen it occurring more and more with this species of tree. Yeah. 
but it also grows those beautiful white blossoms like southern magnolia they're not the same size they're about this big whereas southern magnolia blossoms can get to be that big but they look almost the same So here we have um, a type of moss growing low on the in the swampy areas. This is our um, swamp sphagnum, sphagnum moss, and um, this sphagnum moss has been used traditionally as a bandaging material. It's also been used as stuffing. It's the low, the little green. Yes, yeah, so it looks almost like it's spiky. Like if you were to touch it, it might poke you. But actually, it's extremely absorbent, and uh, fortunately it is because I've realized my Yopon, my black drink, has been leaking into my sack, uh -oh. and the, <laughs> the uh, sphagnum moss has been sucking it up a little bit. But you can pass that around if you want to hold it. It is very soft. Oh, it is. And um, it is extremely absorbent. It, is, it can hold 20 times its own weight mm. in fluids before ever dripping. Okay. Unlike cotton, which will drip before ever even becoming fully saturated. But this has been used um, as stuffing and as bandage material for a long time. Um, because of where it grows. Is it air dried mm -hmm. then or is it Yeah, cooked? this is air dried. Okay. Um, and it, uh, where was I? <laughs> but once it dries out, it actually has antiseptic properties because of where it grows there in the muck and mud. So it will help prevent um, bacteria growth and infection in a wound. I mean, it's not, you know, antibiotic. It won't, you know, prevent really heavy infections. But the, um, this plant was widely used in the Civil War as a way of replacing cotton bandages, which were in severe short supply here in the South, especially. Southern uh, surgeons were struggling to keep you know, wounds bandages, bandaged, and they would often just take a cotton cloth off one guy rinse it out a little bit and put it on another guy. Tons of amputations were happening, um, but there was an effort by the Southern, um, the Confederate Surgeon General to kind of get a knowledge of what plants and animal, uh, not what plants and um, fungus and mosses could be used um, in the Southern um, environment. And there was a book published called Resources of the Southern Fields and Forests that was commissioned by the Confederate Army. And it was provided to surgeons in all of the Army um, campments. So they would collect things from the environment that could be used, this being one of them. And uh, it's been argued that that book alone uh, kind of prolonged the, the war effort because it gave them a surge of new resources they hadn't had, they'd been running short on. Um, and actually the use of this prevented many infections and many amputations for the lucky soldiers who got to use sphagnum moss rather than filthy, filthy cotton cloth. So Makes you wonder how in the world they ever figured out all this stuff. Yeah. Well, actually, um, one of the ways that most likely it was discovered for its curative abilities is uh, it's been seen in nature that a deer that's bleeding and injured will lay on this to really? help stop the bleeding because, you know, by tracking the blood trail of, of deer is the way that you, you, you know, finish them off, find them. And they would come and lay on this and allow their wound to, to dry up and then carry on as a way of escaping, you know, death. But it's been, it's been seen in nature and it's kind of one of those wonders. You don't know how it, how it came to be. But this was even used up into World War I. You can find Googling sphagnum bandage. It's got World War I package. They were packaged in factories using sphagnum moss. Um, and some of the earliest forms of sanitary pads for women were using sphagnum moss. <laughs> so it's been very well documented throughout history as a, as a wonderful resource and uh, kind of a repopulating one. It's renewable. So one of nature's band-aids right there. Any alligators in here? No, I get that a lot. Okay. I have been here four years. 
never seen an alligator. Oh, <laughs> or bears. So no, never, never seen a bear. Yeah. I've seen, we had a deer that came around quite frequently. Everyone called Bucky because he had been hand raised by a neighbor mm -hmm. north of us. And he would come down every once in a while and want petting and some sweet potatoes and then carry on. <laughs> but uh, aside from that, our wildlife is limited to snakes and squirrels and occasional turtle. We rescued a turtle this morning on the boardwalk and I'm like, boy, you're not getting out. This thing's too tight for you to squeeze through. But um, we have here a pine tree, um, quite, a, quite a big one, but nothing close to what would have been here uh, when Europeans first arrived. When Europeans first got to North America and started exploring the Southeast, they came across pine trees that were sometimes eight feet in diameter. I mean, they were enormous. Mm -hmm. I have one that's never been maybe three down. inches around. That's, that's impressive. Yeah, it is. I think it's been there for a couple of hundred years. Probably, probably. Do you know what type of pine it is? It's the same as this. Yeah, slash pine. Yeah. So, actually, this one might be long leaf, Leah. Uh, I think it's slash because yeah, you what, see how the ends what, aren't too thick. Uh, how do you differentiate a yellow pine? So they're all yellow pine. So yeah, slash, okay, but long leaf. Okay. They're 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 both types of yellow pine, but. Longleaf is the slowest growing of the yellow pines. Okay. That's why it was really highly prized. Um, it, it would have that dense golden reddish heart inside from the slow growth, okay. which is why where you get heart of pine, heart pine. Um, and uh, it, was, it was the dominant species in this area. Um, with the loss of the longleaf, slash pine kind of took over as the more dominant one. Um, but the longleaf that they had here had been growing for probably a thousand years or so some of the really old ones are you looking at the yeah if it's got three three it's got three yeah so it's longleaf oh okay yep okay. if it's got two it's slash two of the little prongs mm -hmm. so. but um usually i talk about this one at the other one at the back corner but so the longleaf pine trees in this area thrived on that cycle of forest fires that's because longleaf pine is adapted to survive fires um, that thick bark acts like an armor protecting the tree. Even baby pine, longleaf pine trees will often survive a fire. Those needles, they look, so when they grow, they kind of look like an 80s style mullet. So it's big bushy on the top and then it grows straight out at the bottom. But those needles will insulate the candle or the, um, the woody part of the tree starting to grow. And as the fire burns, those needles will drip, drip liquid drip water and it helps create an insulating layer around the tree and so the babies will actually survive fires it's been documented um but not only that the way that fires traditionally would have started in the longleaf pine ecosystem was the um was lightning lightning in this area is well known to be very very uh common occurrence we're one of the lightning strike capitals of uh the united states if not the world and that's because the cycles of forest fires were important to the ecosystem and they had adapted to that high fire environment and had lived that way for thousands and thousands of years. Um, however, when the lumber industry came into the area, they would cut down every tree because the forest looked like this. Every single tree was money, was pure solid income. They would cut every tree down and they did not replant. They did not allow one tree here and there to drop new, you know, and grow new trees. They cut every tree. It was called clear cutting and it horribly deforested the longleaf pine ecosystem. The original ecosystem was 90 million acres stretching from Virginia to Texas and it was contiguous. It didn't have gaps. It just went the whole way. But after the longleaf pine industry ravaged all of that, there's less than, uh, estimates are about less than 1 million acres survive today. Um, a lot of that has probably needs to be recalculated because much of the, the forests were in the area of Florida that got struck by Hurricane Michael. So all those pine trees you see knocked over, mm -hmm. that was some of the untouched pine that you know was regrowing and coming back. And uh, unfortunately, they're starting back over from scratch in many of those areas. But you can see the longleaf <coughs> pine starting to grow back in areas of Blackwater River State Park, State Forest. And it's really miraculous to see. They do the regular fires like they needed and it's beautiful. It looks like a manicured lawn when you look out with all the wired grass. And you can see for miles between the trees. So hard to imagine it today when you look out and see all the hardwood stuff that has kind of replaced it because of the lack of fires. So, but 
you can <coughs> if you can imagine it it was a, it was a it was probably a wonder to behold so but pine could be used for a variety of things when we get out i'm going to take you guys a little bit onto the nature trails not too far because i'm scared of it being really wet but there's one part where some of the trees have been injured and you can see the sap dripping out and sap's the really amazing part of the trees Yeah, they never get smaller than the finger. That's right. And so that's what I was looking at. And there were a few that were pretty yeah. thick. So it's just weird because it's so wet here. We don't expect it to be long. Yeah. The other one on the other side, I'm pretty sure that one. with pine beetles after those pine trees get hit by lightning? Um, I mean, we've kind of just let nature take its course out here. I've never really taken a good close look after a pine tree falls out here. More often than not, the trees that fall here are like our cedars and um, the uh, various types of gum trees or whatnot that, you know, live in the really wet soil. So the, like, the roots are you know, if there's a, even a gentle wind, those wet, swampy areas, the roots can easily come uprooted. So those fall more often than, I don't know that I've ever seen a, a pine tree fall out here, to be honest. Well, no, you get hit by lightning where it opens up the oh. flash and it, it attracts pine beetles. At we, least back in Texas, they do. <laughs> we actually have a pine tree that was struck by lightning. Um, at, we passed it and I didn't point it out, but it has scarred and the tree is still healthy. And it was mm -hmm. struck five years ago. So um, it's continuing to grow. So it didn't yeah. clearly didn't get pine beetles no. in that one. But now, the pine beetle will kill a tree. Yeah. They get infected with them. But yeah, the, the, they're pretty amazing that they can actually heal themselves unless they they get you know infected with pine beetles. They can they can scab over and keep on growing. Whether they like most trees would die from a lightning strike like that. All right, so we're crossing Pond Creek. Uh, this is a sandy bottom creek, and when it's been dry, you can see straight to the bottom. Um, but we've had a little bit of rain the last couple weeks, and so the water's got some sediments in it. But when it's clear, you can see every little stone at the bottom of the creek for the most part. So every little stone, so there are, it's a gravel bottom? It does have some gravel bottom spots, but there's also ironstone along the bottom that was placed there as various types of erosion prevention. So where the water wheel was especially, there was a big bed of ironstone to prevent the sand from getting stirred up. On this side of Pond Creek, you start to see a plant growing over here that you don't see on the south side of Pond, or on the, um, yeah, the south side of, north side of Pond Creek. Oh my gosh, directions are killing me today. Um, but the, over here you'll start to see saw palmetto growing um, in the drier spots. And saw palmetto had a variety of uses. Um, the fronds could be woven into various things, baskets, fish traps, um, hats even. Uh, you could overlap the fronds to become roofing material uh, for um, Native Americans. But also, you could peel apart the fibers, and you can see some starting to come apart here. And you could braid them and weave them into um, twine or ropes. And so it was very useful for everyday life. Um, but not only that, you could actually eat the, the fresh um, bases of the palm fronds. The, um, and you peel the outer part off, it was edible in times of like survival situations. Um, but it also does grow a berry. So saw palmetto does, some of them do grow fruits. It's a black fleshy fruit. Um, and it was uh, coveted by Native Americans as what they called an aphrodisiac. They thought that it, you know, was like a love miracle. Yeah, yeah, you can 
feel it. <laughs> we'll have it tonight. It's going to come, the, the rain. But uh, salt palmetto is still actually very much used in men's health medications, uh, especially. You can find it on mm -hmm. pharmacy shelves today. So, but that's actually using the essence of the berry. So that has the health benefits. But, any questions? Uh, back there on the block, there is a plant. Oh, that is cedar. It, it is a cedar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's white cedar. Mm -hmm. And you know, it doesn't have any smell like um, cedar tree, cedar shrubs, or yeah. anything like that. They have, have more of a piney smell or something. The other. I feel like that should have other smell. Cedar it does. Tree. It does. Oh, I you, couldn't. If you break the the. Oh, the, I bit it. Oh, you bit it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if you just smell it, you can. Smell oh, a now I do from mm -hmm. the. Yeah. 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 It's yeah, the I sap just, that I has the smell. Piece the leaves it, don't have, won't have that much of the no, smell, but no, that the sap in, inside okay, the. I see now. Yeah. It smells nice, doesn't it? Mm, it smells yeah. like Christmas. I know, I love that smell. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else feel like reliving the holidays? <laughs> All right. Do you want to keep this a memento? <laughs> I want to check with a tree that I have on my property. Okay. So yes. Um. Before we head back, we can stop here too. One of the um. One of the really unique parts of the site that we only just recently discovered. Nature plants are a variety of carnivorous plants, meaning they get their nutrients from insects or small animals. Pitcher plants are mostly insects. Um, so you can see the little white top. It's right down here through this oh, little opening. Okay. And it's actually got a big reddish blossom yeah. up above it. And that reddish blossom is where the seeds are. And when that blossom falls, you'll have new pitcher plants grow up next year. Um, but that white top attracts insects and there's like a sticky sweet enzyme inside that attracts the insects and they get stuck in there, fall in, and um, they're digested through the, the stalk of the plant. Um, never found any medicinal or other type of use by peoples or cultures, but it is just a cool plant. Like, who doesn't pretty. love a good carnivorous uh, bug-eating plant? <laughs> I think it's pretty heavily protected, too. It is. These are very heavily protected. Um, they are an endangered plant species, um, mostly because the best places they grow are actually in ditches along, along the roads. Wetlands. Yeah, wetlands. And so um, the the wetlands environments are, you know, being, they're mm -hmm. being dried up, they're being drained, they're being, you know, raised for neighborhoods. And so these plants are being, you know, pretty heavily decimated. But there's been efforts, especially in this part of Santa Rosa County, to protect mm -hmm. them by uh, designating wetland or wildflower areas, especially along Garcon Point Peninsula. Garcon Point Peninsula is like renowned in the area for having um, some of the most diverse patches of, um, of pitcher plants in North America. You can walk out and there's this one bog where they're just everywhere. It's beautiful. And there are many different kind of pitcher plants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some are so tiny you can raise them in a little pot in your mm -hmm. house. Many people do cultivate them in their homes. I have yeah. to tell you about a plant that I discovered this year. It's the first time I've seen it growing on the roadside by my house. And um, I've lived there for well, I've lived here for 45 years, and, and where I am now, I've lived for 19 years. And they're called lawn orchids. I don't okay. know if you've ever seen them or not. There are a few native orchids um, that do grow in this area. And yeah. I, I found it in a Florida plant That's amazing. Book. I just, I was so amazed when I saw them. They were pretty little, and they're a stalk about maybe that tall. And then the, the flower part is about that long, and there's maybe 20 or 15 or 20 little orchids growing on that stalk. That's amazing. And I did You ever heard of that one, Leah? Are they purple? No, they're white. Uh, but they have the throat and everything. They're That's just amazing. so pretty. Aww. Yeah, tropical types of species like that in certain parts of Florida, this part of Florida, they do do well here. I mean, it's, it's amazing. The di diversity of the wetlands um, in this part of Florida and the uplands, like, uh, there's been plant scientists who, when they take one square yard of um, longleaf pine ecosystem and they look at each species of plant, there's hundreds, hundreds of species in one square yard yeah. of ground. Yeah. And it's just amazing that there's so much diversity in the ecosystem here and it's just not, not promoted. It's not widely, you know, yeah. you know documented, so. No. Do you know what these little black things are that are flying about? They look like a dragonfly, but they they're have They're damselflies. The little They're tiny delicate ones. Yeah. Damselflies? Damselflies, okay. yeah. 
I identified this vine last year. It's called cross vine. It's got pretty red um, blossoms on it. It's a native species as well. You ever seen those before? No. Oh. And what is it called? It's called cross vine. Cross vine. Looks like a trumpet vine. Yeah, yeah. it does. Trumpet flower. Do you know why it's called cross vine? Does it have like a cross in the... I'm not sure. Oh. I am not sure what the origination of that, of that name is. Okay. Here's some damsel flies right there. Right there, just landed on that leaf. Uh huh. Got a couple of them. Yeah, yeah. I think they were mating. Yeah. <laughs> Tis the season. Spring is in the air. Anyone who who watched Bandy, Bambi, their Twitter page, it all the plants and animals are getting pretty uh, finding love. <laughs> So um, we are close to this tree here. Um, it's an old cedar tree, and at the base of it, there's a hole in it. And um, as we pass by, you'll actually be able to see there's a natural beehive in there. Um, honeybees have taken up residence in there, and they've come and gone many times throughout the years. Um, and we've never had any incidents with them, knock on wood. Uh, bees are fairly docile, so long as you're not messing with their homes, swatting out. Oh, there's a skink on the thing. You see it? <laughs> right there at the bus side. The, um, skink? A skink, yeah. Right there, you see him yeah. crawling? <laughs> Gotta love it. You never know what you'll see out here. But anyways, bees were very highly prized, not only for their honey, but bees wax had endless uses for a oh, colonial no, ecosystem, or for a colonial economy. <laughs> you, you're not feeling it? No, I see the bees. <laughs> But um, beeswax could be used for a variety of things, from surgeon soap wow. to, um, uh, you know, binding things, waterproofing. Um, but most valued was soap or was uh, candles. Um, candles were um, really like extremely important to the early colonists here. Clearly, they didn't have electricity. Um, but also, you know, lamp oil, lantern oil very expensive and candles could be made in the home you could make them yourselves um, there were two other varieties of candles that were made especially down here um, uh, candle from um, bayberry or wax myrtle and also candles from um, animal fat rendered animal fat so um, these candles were a little bit more uh, reliable because rendered animal fat um, that those candles could smell really bad, <laughs> especially in the summertime. They would go rancid in the heat, mm. and man, you did not want to light one of those. You didn't want to be that person. So beeswax, though, it's got a really high flame, like it burns um, really bright, and it doesn't leave behind a residue or anything. And so it this doesn't have to have a wick in it. It does. This one does. It's just it's bent over. A little wick there. Yeah, they had. They had. They would use. Mm -hmm. They would use a wick. Okay. But um, the the wax itself, it does heat. It does mm -hmm. um, evaporate in a, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So um, usually, when this candle would burn, there'd be very little wax left over at the bottom because the wax itself would burn off. And um, it was very clean burning, mm -hmm. versus you know, fat candles that were not very clean burning. Um, so. I wonder if the wax myrtle smelled bad too. The wax myrtle smelled wonderful. That's what I was thinking. That yes. It should from the. And oh, that's not the picture. It well, does grow native I in this it. area. I've never identified it on the site. I've had people out here try to identify it because it should grow here. Like this is a perfect environment for wax myrtle or what is it's also called southern bayberry. Um, but you can see on the berries there, it's got like a, a whitish exterior. When you boil the, the berries, that is the waxy coating on them, and it comes off and it floats to the top, you cool the water, and then it's just, you, you pull it out. It's, it solidifies there on the surface of the water. And um, it made a actually a greenish wax. You can see one here. 
me. So, hmm. and they smelled very good. They, <laughs> it's a damselfly. You're saying, yeah, well, <laughs> you never know. And determined to come to me. There was some back there that were just. They like the flowers on your shirt. Oh, that's right. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> but bayberry um, had a very lovely scent. It was also very clean burning. And people would often pull this out of the holidays. And you can still find them. You can buy them. And most of the time they're marketed as, you know, holiday candles, Christmas time candles. So they have a lovely, um, a lovely berry, like floral smell to them. So now we're going to continue a little further. We're going to go a little ways onto the trail, but not too far. We okay? So you'll notice we're actually starting to, the ground is getting higher. We're getting onto the um, edge of the valley here. And so we're actually coming upon the uplands of this uh, part of the property. And so you start to see different types of plants. You start to see different varieties of trees. Here we've got actually a, I believe this is a sand oak. This looks like an oak to me. Is that an oak? Yeah. So that's the type of oaks trees you'll actually find growing like near the beaches. They don't get very big. They stay pretty small, they're shrubs. And so you'll start to see these sandy, sandier growing plants that need um, drier, drier feet, drier soil. Violets? No, I didn't get violets. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh. Cute. Yeah, I'm not an expert at the, the little I, I I can't identify flowers. Oh, well, like there's so many. There's so many. I knew a lady in one of my naturalist classes. She had a whole book of Florida flowers. And I mean, it was like this thick and they were categorized by color. And I'm just like, <laughs> there's no way. There's no way you can learn every single one of these. But there are people who do. Like they actually make the effort to try to identify every single flower. No, thank you. There's some more, I think. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. little wet here. I want to stick to the sides. These are blueberries, I think. Yeah. Blueberries? Blueberries, okay. All right, so here we've got a pine tree that's been, um, that got injured during the construction of our bridge. We actually stored some heavy machinery up here and the builders were not very careful about bumping into the trees at times. And so this pine tree, you can actually see, it's still seeping uh, ra uh, resin. So you can see some of it, right? Oh, it just flicked off. Um, you can still see some of the bright orange and yellowy resin. This one's still, still soft right there. So this, is often used for actually people put this in wounds, especially the hard crystallized ones. They'll put it in, in fresh wounds to seal it up, keep it clean. And um, this resin would be collected in the turpentine industry. So they would create cat faces in the tree, notches angled down and they'd have a pot below it collecting the sap. And then the sap would be um, uh, boiled and in a distilling process. So much like you imagine distilling liquor, like you would take the, the mashed up pro uh, plant product, you'd boil it and then it evaporates and that evaporated stuff becomes a liquor. What you get from the distillation process of sap is turpentine. And turpentine uh, back then had a variety of uses. The paint thinner, 
and uh, would you carry this for me? It's leaking everywhere. <laughs> it's a paint thinner, um, and also it's very, very aromatic. If, if anyone's ever smelled straight turpentine, it's got a very strong scent. Um, but when it was discovered, um, the process of turpentining was discovered, people came up with a really, some really crazy ideas for how to use it. Um, some of the historical uh, text that I've come across said, yeah, you can just inject some and it cures malaria. Um, yeah, just put it into a battle wound and like it'll, you know, keep it clean. Don't do those things. Do not put this on a baby's umbilical cord. <laughs> doesn't do it doesn't do what you think it's going to do um but people came up with every which way of trying to use this they did come across one way of using turpentine that we actually still use it in uh today so i'm going to pass this around if anyone wants to take a, a whiff of it don't put your nose right over just kind of do the, the wafting thing yeah i know what turpentine but, smells like <laughs> there used to be a turpentine plant in pensacola years ago yeah i mean since i've lived here yeah I can smell you'll it know it when you smell it I'm downwind of it. I can you, smell do you it. smell it now? You don't. I don't want to. I'm scared. Okay, it's not that bad. <laughs> but the reason I have it is because, yeah, many people haven't smelled turpentine, but they have smelled something that has it in it. They believe that putting turpentine on your chest would cure heart wounds and lung ailments. And, I mean, it's not good to put this on your, like, straight on your skin. However, by rendering it and creating an oil from it, um, it will help open your airways. And so people still use this in Vicks Vapor Rub. So Vicks Vaporub smells like turpentine slightly. That's because it does have turpentine oil in it. So thank you guys. You came up with at least one way of using it that's actually decent. But um, you also, after you would um, render that, uh, that sap, you'd get the turpentine, but the leftover product was called pitch. And pine pitch had a, or rosin had a variety of uses. It's kind of waxy. And it was used just like beeswax in waterproofing things. And people would rub this on the decks of ships to, you know, scuff it up, make it not slippery. Um, if you want to pass it around, it's actually kind of chalky. It won't leave anything really on your skin. But um, it was also melted down and put into wooden canteens and wooden buckets to waterproof them. So there were a variety of uses for, for this. And so being that um, it had so many uses, the larger industry of collecting sap was called naval stores. And so often you'll find this in historical texts. This area is great for naval stores. That means they would have come, taken the, ter um, taken the sap, and used the byproducts of the sap to... Um, uh, so is the sap used, was it used medicinally or... Um, I mean, you could, like I said, you could take the, the sticky sap and you could put it in a wound to, to help it stay clean. Because sap is fairly clean. Um, but aside from that, I don't think so. I'm not sure. You wouldn't eat it. No, once the turpentine was out of it, then the sap was okay. I mean, the hardened sap. I'm not sure. Oh. That, well, the hardened leftover stuff yeah, was yeah. this pitch. I don't know that you oh, could use pitch, that I mean. use yeah. that medically. They had a variety of uses, like okay. I said, but I never came across any medically. Um, however, that being said, uh, this tree uh, eventually it will scar, and um, the sap will stop leaking like it like it is, um, because it works much like our own blood does in that you know it'll scar and sc scab and scar and help the tree continue to grow. It seems okay for now. It's been a few years now since this happened and it's still okay, so. All right, well, I can see ahead that it gets quite muddy up ahead. Um, we have another trail up there where we have another type of plant called pink sundew. That's the only additional plant mm. we have that we typically talk about. If anyone wants to try and be brave, that's fine, but that trail gets very wet, which is why you see pink sundew there. They're also a type of carnivorous plant and they're beautiful little pink rosettes. And each end has like a wide basal rosette and it's got little hairs on it that when an ant comes across it, it curls up and it actually digests the ants. And those enzymes for that they use to digest those ants can actually be helpful for people. Um, it was used, uh, rubbed onto like fungal infections of the skin and uh, helped cure um, infections on uh, skin, you know, diseases and ailments. Is that water down there around that tree that's in the middle? Most likely. It looks yeah. like it. We can go look further that's if you'd like. Enough. I'm down for adventure if y'all are. <laughs> we made it this far. <laughs>
Gotta watch them roots. <laughs> oh no. This is almost like knee deep right here. That's pink sundew land. So start looking around at the edges of this trail, and you'll see tiny little pink bud looking things along the edges of the trails see right here here's a good one you can see yeah. the little tiny hairs and the hairs early in the morning they'll collect dew and they sparkle they're just so beautiful but they are literally covering covering the edges of these trails and like i said those are called pink sundew and those um little i think it's these shoes talking is it these nope it's, it's no, these it's the pink one the red one with oh, the hair. Oh, okay, down here under yep. the straw. Yeah. Yep. Right there. Oh, and they attract specifically oh, they ants. Yeah. And the ants will come across them. They have like a, a sticky substance on them. When the ants crawl over it, they get stuck. Yeah, they struggle. The more struggle, the more they get stuck. Yeah. And it's really amazing to watch them be digested. You might, if you really look, if you want to look, I've come across one or two where they are curled up around an mm. ant. So if you look hard and you want to get some epic yeah. footage. But they're adorable little guys. Here's a good sized one here too. I like the little, what do you call this stuff, lichen? Yes, <laughs> that's <laughs> deer moss. Like deer moss, cool yeah. It. Is it the only sundews around here? Or the I believe that's kind? the only type. Okay. But yeah, do they're they beautiful. Get, did they get bigger than that? No, that's about it. Yeah. And you can see this one, this one has a little, a little blossom at the top. It's got a little mm -hmm. stem that comes up. They have a little, uh, Route. Oh, here's a good size one. Okay, this is a big one right here. You can oh, see the, yeah. the stem of it right there. Now, does the stem do any? Uh... See how sparkly they are from the from the water from the moisture. Yeah. Got a little shimmer in that one. Oh, it's pretty. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah, that is. I've never noticed that. What's that? That's one oh, too. that's a that's different huge, kind. Yeah, it's a different one. How about yeah. this stuff right here? Do you know what this is? I did learn what that was at one time and I forgot. Oh, okay. But yes, I asked somebody, so what is this? People always ask me. It is a type of moss. Uh -huh. It is a type of moss. Leah, any knowledge? There's a nice big salt palmetto back there too. But yeah, this is a really unique part of the trail where you can see um, those pink sundew mm -hmm. and the various types of moss. And we don't really understand why this patch of grass grows here too. Like, we don't cut it, it just stays this height kind of. It's maintained, self-maintained in a way. So, this is a tai tai, I think. Um, what is that? Is it sparkleberry? No, no, that's not sparkleberry. The hairs, the leaves are hairy. I don't think it's a tie tie though. I'm not gonna touch it because you never know. <laughs> you never know. So. All right, you guys made it. If you want, this trail does loop around, but it's it does get really wet on the other side too. So I usually turn around and head back here.
really? Yeah. This is a young pine tree, but this is not long leaf. Yeah. That one, I believe, is slash. Yeah. So. Now, the three needle one was what? Long leaf. And the two needle? But loblolly can also have three leaves, three. But they're easy to tell the difference. They don't look anything alike, like the tree themselves, physically. What are the ones with the 